Well, good morning. For those of you who received the MailChimp, uh, you've seen that I've been sending out some information about something called the All Nations Festival, right? And how uh, we need help for the All Nations Festival. So today, the folks who put that festival on are here to talk to us. We're so excited. We have Ron and Lois here with us today. Uh, they represent Palm Ministries, and we are so grateful for our relationship with Palm, for our partnership with them. We have quite a few of our folks who attend this church who go faithfully and volunteer and serve uh, in Edmonton there. And we're so grateful for that partnership because the work that they do uh, is so impactful and I believe so close to the heart of God. And so I wanted to just introduce them. Ron, you can come up. He's going to share with us today. And then his wife Lois is going to be giving us a specific update on Palm Ministries, on the center. And so we're really looking forward to that. Can I pray for you really quickly? Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity that we have here uh, this morning to hear what's going on in the city at Palm, Lord, to hear about the ways that you're working and that you're moving, Lord, and how you love the nations and how you have given us opportunities to not even have to leave our province in order to engage in this missional work. Jesus, I pray that you would bless this time, that you would speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you. It's great to be here with you this morning, and we are deeply appreciative of the partnership we have with you here at Fort Saskatchewan Alliance, and it's great to have some familiar faces, yes, that we get to see week in and week out as you make the trek into our center in downtown Edmonton. Some of you that used to do that, it's good to see you again, too. And for those of you who don't know much about us, hopefully you'll learn a little bit more this morning about the ministry, and then as Lois comes to get a little bit more of an insight into uh, us personally too, and some more details. So we're going to dive in this morning and look at what God and his attitude towards the foreigner, and also uh, what is home for us. So hang on to your seats. It's not going to be one passage where we go through three verses. We're going to be all over the place, but I hope you'll go on the journey with me. So first, a question for you. Have you had an experience where you have been displaced or perhaps just an ordinary move from one house to another? Anybody ever been through that? Yeah, most of us. Do you remember that feeling of kind of unsettledness? Uh, the most distinct memory I have like that of that unsettledness was when Lois and I were living overseas and at that time, our son Nate was just a wee little guy, just had been born, and we went back overseas, and the authorities would not give us permission to live anywhere in like a regular apartment, only in a hotel. And so it was such an uncomfortable feeling to have nowhere that we could call home. It's not a great place to be in, yeah? Now, those of us in Alberta, usually, regularly, this is maybe not a common occurrence for us, though. But this spring, we were reminded of how thankful we should be for our homes, yes? When over th about 30,000 people at one point this spring were pushed out of their homes by wildfires, right? That's not that long ago. We all remember, yeah? So thankfully, that is not a common occurrence for us here in Canada. But... Many of you, I think, are aware, your church is, yeah, you've partnered with us, you've sponsored a, a refugee family, you're aware of the bigger picture in our globe today, and you know that this displacement of people is actually very common. So just a few quick statistics for you. So there are about 100 million people in our world today who have been pushed out of their home. Okay, and of that number, around 30 million are what we technically call refugees. That means they've been pushed out of their home country to a different nation, 30 million. So if you do the math, you can see that there's still a whole lot of people, somewhere around 70 million, that they're displaced from their homes, but they're still within their country of origin. So huge things going on in our world today, right? Like the headlines recently has been on the Ukraine. But realistically, that's only one conflict in many around the globe today. And the sobering reality is 40% of those displaced people who've been forced to leave their land of origin and become refugees, 40% are children. 
So there are huge needs out there. And that's why we, Palm Ministries, exist, is to try to meet this need, to embrace newcomers to Canada with Jesus' love, to come alongside them and whatever their practical needs are, whether it be for housing or for food or for English, and yes, for their spiritual needs to come alongside and meet those needs. And many of you have joined us in helping to do that. Sometimes, though, when we meet people from other cultures and we see them, sometimes our first instinct is to think they're very other because they don't maybe look like us. They maybe don't dress like us. And especially when we perhaps encounter people from a different faith background, like a Muslim woman wearing a hijab, we think, oh, how do I relate? What do I say? Well, the reality is, more than anything, they are people just like us, that God loved and gave his life for, and they are mothers who have dreams for their children and simply want peace and stability and a future for their children, just like you and I wish for our children. And even when it comes in terms of sharing our faith, what's important to us, even that, we need to pause a moment and not think it's a closed door, because uh, for us as Westerners, I'm not saying this as a model or a suggestion, but I think the reality is sometimes we separate our faith from like our workplace or our professional lives from our profession of faith. But uh, we don't have time to dive into that today, but I would suggest to you that that is not what Scripture presents to us as the model. We are to be integrated people. We are followers of Jesus, wherever we are and whatever we're doing. But often people, one thing we can learn perhaps from like our, our Muslim neighbors is there's no separation like that usually. You can tell very readily, even from the way they dress, what their faith is, like the woman wearing the hijab. And as they live out their faith, we have to be quick, I think, to stop and say, don't let that be a barrier to us building a bridge. Or even believing that they might be open to hearing what we have experienced in our faith journey. So let me tell you a quick story, okay? To, to give you an example. Now let me say off the top, I'm, we have some pictures and I'm sharing some stories. These are true stories but I'm changing the names and I'm not using the real picture to protect their privacy, okay? So let me start by telling you about Nancy. And I should really have Shauna up here telling this story because Shauna knows Nancy much better than I do. Uh, she came to uh, our center, or got in contact with our center a few months ago. Um, she began studying online and Shauna was her teacher and identified quite quickly that because of what she was going through, she really needed people around her. So she urged us to find space in our in-person classes for her. And so we did, and she began coming. And Nancy has a fascinating story. Her country of origin is one where she quite remarkably rose up and had a position of influence and was leading many others. And then there was a regime change and she suddenly had a target on her back for being a woman who led other women. So she fled, and she ended up here in Edmonton. And she dresses much like you would see in this picture here, <clears throat> but um, she was not put off at all when we were open with her about who we are as followers of Jesus. And one specific incident to relate to you, she came uh, you, uh, even though I've only shared a few bare details, I think you get the picture that her journey has not been an easy one, yeah? So she came to us and there was one particular day after she'd been with us for a few weeks where she was just so agitated and she went from like being unable to sit still to coming in, we got her into our, our building and um, she then went into almost like a comatose state. She just was clearly not herself, right? Something was really wrong. And then she shared with us that she's on medication for depression and she'd been unable to fill her prescription. And so we're, you know, silently praying and then trying to arrange a ride to take her back home. And Lois just slept, slipped into the quiet room where we had her lying down and just said, can I pray for you? 
and no hesitation at all. And so just a simple prayer saying, God, you see the need, please heal her. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the rest of that week, we didn't see Nancy. She disappeared. We wondered how she was doing. We hoped all was well. But a week later, Nancy came back through our doors. And she came in smiling radiantly and walked through the doors, found Lois, gave her a big bear hug. And Lois said, wow, seems you're doing well. She said, I am. So you got your prescription renewed. No. But you prayed for me. All that to say, we sometimes, in our Western mindset of medicine and modernity, <laughs> we maybe sometimes dismiss the power of prayer and God at work. But this Nancy, she believed she'd been prayed for, and that made a difference. So one quick side story on that, too. Where we uh, have our center, uh, there's lots of activity often on the streets around there. One of our neighbors had been there on the day. She'd seen Nancy all agitated in front of our building. <clears throat> and then a week later, uh, after Nancy had come in all seemingly happy, that man came in and said to one of our staff that many of you know, Nasser, he said, hey, I need to know what this place is all about. Last week I saw this woman, looked like she was, had real trouble. This week I saw her leave your place and she was smiling. Are you a mental health clinic, or what happens here? <laughs> so again, the song we just sang is such a meaningful one. God is faithful, right? God is good. And that is what, if you don't hear anything else this morning, I hope you walk out having heard some of these stories, being assured God is faithful, God is good, he is at work. And yes, at the center in the ministry we have, but that's true whatever's going on in your lives as well. All right, so uh, all that to say, um, if we were, we're going to do a little bit of a survey this morning of God's heart for the foreigner or the displaced. His heart is always with those who are the other or those that might, we might uh, think of as needing a helping hand, right? There's lots of verses about orphans and widows and the priority God puts on them. And so... Uh, our role, yes, is our ministry, but we would suggest to us, especially as Jesus' church, wherever we are, is to provide that welcome in Jesus' name, especially to those who might be uh, the underdog. Let's look at one verse where this is stated right at the beginning of our scriptures. Leviticus 19.33 says, Do not take advantage of foreigners who live among you, in your land. That was set out in the law of God right from the beginning, right? And they're reminded that they were taken to Egypt, and so they should know better. They were the outsider who was mistreated. So don't do that, God says. Now, thankfully, we live in a country that is known for embracing the outsider. Now, that, of course, not every moment of every day does that happen, but in general, Canada is a nation that opens its doors to the world. So I am thankful to be in a country like that, that represents this biblical value. And again, I'll try to keep it short. This, the, we, we have a, a family at the center that we've been interacting with for about the last 18 months. Um, and they have come to call Canada home now, Edmonton, for about 18 months. And... Uh, they have shared with us that they feel at home here, not just the place where they live, but they feel at home here. So let me unpack that a little bit for you. She's from a minority group in her home country. So all the years of growing up, she always felt other, like she stood out, and their people are discriminated against. So they left that context and moved to the nation of Turkey, where they lived for a number of years, and their life was that they didn't have the same uh, pressures on them as in their homeland, but even there, they stood out. They were other. They were always different and didn't have the same freedoms and opportunities that they would long for. But then she came here to Edmonton, and she said, I finally feel at home. That this is a place where nobody looks down on me because of my skin color or my accent. 
This is a place where I can just live my life with my children, my husband, and it's okay. So that, I think, is something that we can build on. But of course, uh, while we're glad for her to feel comfortable here in Canada, in Edmonton, we know that that's not our ultimate goal, right? As we come alongside people, yes, we want to help them feel at home. But we also, because of our faith in Jesus, know that none of us are truly at home until we find our home in Christ. So listen to this quote by St. Augustine. Here's how he puts it. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. So our true home, of course, is only found in God. And you know what? Scripture even goes farther than that. It's not just us that feels restless. God himself feels restless until our hearts are at rest in him. Where do I get that from? Think about one of the stories that Jesus tells. It's in Matthew 18. And we'll pull up the verse here and we can look at it together. It's the story of... Um, sheep and, a, and one particular lost sheep, right? Here's what it says. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go out to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. There's a party in heaven every time somebody says yes to Jesus. I want to tell you very briefly about a party we were at this last week. It was our family got on a plane and flew to Ontario and were part of a family Bible camp for people who uh, come from a Muslim background but have now put their faith and trust in Jesus. And for many of these people, even that we were with this last week, um, they've never gathered in a setting like this. Yeah, they might, okay, let me clarify. They might go to a church in whatever city they live in, in North America, but they've never had an opportunity to be with people from their same background who use their same language to worship together in a corporate setting. Can you imagine never being able to sing together the praises of God in your first language? only by yourself, or maybe with your wife, or maybe with a very small group. But to have a room full of people praising God together, that was the gift of this past week that we had, which was a huge encouragement to us, but especially for those who'd never experienced that before. So one young man that I'll tell you about, uh, represented by this picture here, he, he's 25 years old. He was actually raised in a home where his mother and father decided to follow Jesus, but he had never before in his life been together with more than a couple other people who knew his language and loved Jesus. And he came to North America uh, about seven years ago, and the year after he came, his country uh, closed its borders and a genocide started against his people group. They're being systematically wiped out. And so he, he was very sobered by this, <laughs> and he now has said, it's my responsibility to be open about my faith. I need to let others know about the hope I have in Jesus. Uh, and so it was a joy to be able to pray with him and just hear his story and encourage him. Yes, God has a plan and purpose for your life, and there was a prophecy over him that God would use him just like we see in the story of Joseph in Genesis, right? God sent him ahead to save his people, not only his immediate family, but also his entire people group. So we're believing and trusting good things. Also this past week, there was another family there. They uh, were, they've been believers for a few years, but this is the first time they've ever been able to gather like this with other fellow believers from their background. And the wife has just been so hungry for God's word. Every opportunity she gets, she's opening up the Bible and studying it and and passing that on to her children. 
and she has such a passion for sharing her faith. She's an evangelist. So um, she, it was a joy to now see these uh, people that we've been working with, some of them for more than a decade, and to see them now move from being those that we're pouring into to becoming our partners in ministry. So this woman actually went with Lois and made a visit and uh, was able to share the gospel with one of her own people. So this is the kind of thing that we see God doing as he calls people to himself. As he calls, first it's just the one right, the one lost sheep. But as they enter the fold, then they want to call yet others to join them in the sheep pen. Well, this shouldn't surprise us because, again, as we look through Scripture, we see that over and over again there's this refrain of God's heart for the foreigner. Um, we looked at Leviticus. But then as you think about even God's people through the story of the Old Testament, are they stationary in one place? Not at all. It's all about movement, isn't it? Yeah. And they, God's people, even though God said he chose the Jewish people as his own chosen people, they were often in places where they were the foreigner. They were the stranger. So they should have understood that feeling and heard God's message that they're to think of others as those to be welcomed in. They weren't called simply to be separated and apart, but they needed to be set apart to call people to something different. But that was to be shared. And just like we maybe don't always get it, neither did they. But when you look at the structure of what of the promised land and how as they moved into it, some things that were set up, it reflects again, not just God's heart for the Jewish people, but for the foreigner. So two quick examples, okay? Um, number one, when the tribes, you remember how the tribes were assigned different parts of the promised land? And then in, the, in those areas, there were what were called cities of refuge. You with me? You know what I'm talking about? Yes? So if somebody committed a crime, like we would call it manslaughter, right? If somebody accidentally killed somebody else, the, per, the family of the victim might want revenge. But there were these cities that people could run to and claim refuge, where they were safe. And these cities were not just for the Jewish people. Did you know that? They were for anybody, including the foreigners who lived there. There was mercy for the stranger as well. And it's really interesting. You see uh, on the map there, the circles represent a one day's journey. So almost anywhere in Israel, you could get to one of these cities of refuge in one day's journey. Again, not just for the Jewish people, but for anyone who felt they were at risk. And then, of course, we all know about the temple. Right, the Jewish people so proud of the temple they built. And, 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 and God uh, gave instructions on the temple. So it wasn't just their idea. But there, and there were restrictions, right? The, the inner sanctuary was only for the Jewish people. But there was also an outer court. And that was open to people of all nations. Remember when Jesus came and cleaned out the temple? He said, this is to be a place of prayer. And that area was to be a place where the foreigner could also come and worship God. So again, all through scriptural history, we see God's heart for the foreigner. <clears throat> um, explicitly in the Psalms, we see that too. One, just one example from Psalm 146.9, we read, the Lord protects the foreigners among us. He cares for the orphans and widows. All right, so you get the idea. We could go through many, many verses that all have the same theme. But let's look just at the example that we're all to follow, the example of Jesus. And what do we see from him and his attitude towards the foreigner? Remember that when his public ministry was just starting, he went back to his hometown, he went back to Nazareth, he stood up in the temple, he was handed the scroll of Isaiah, and he read that passage about, it's a very powerful passage, yeah, about setting the oppressed free. That's what he read, and then sat down and said, this has been fulfilled today. And then, 
he says some other very powerful and disturbing words to the congregation. Remember what happens after that? They got up and took him out to stone him or throw him over the cliff. They did not like what they heard. What was it that got them so rattled? Here's what Luke 4 says Jesus then said. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet, Elijah was not sent to any of them but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. Okay, if you don't get it, to a foreigner, right? Not to somebody who is a part of the chosen people of God. God sent Elijah to a foreigner. And then he goes on. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elijah the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. Once again, a foreigner. So this is what Jesus explicitly says. He's highlighting for the people at his time, God's heart has always been for the other, to draw them near, to demonstrate to them that God loves the whole world, not just his chosen people. And good thing too, right? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't need to ask for a show of hands, but I doubt that many of us have Jewish lineage, do we? Probably most of us would be out if our salvation depended on being part of God's chosen people, right? But thankfully, that's not the measure, right? That's not how we're made acceptable to God. Ephesians 2 says that we were without God and without hope. But thanks be to God, through Christ, we are all members of one body. As it says in verse 19 of Ephesians 2, now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. So most all of us in some way have been a part of a family. We may have uh, good or challenging relationships with them, but all of us in some way are part of a family. And for most of us, family is important, yes? It's who we want to be with, it's who we spend time with, uh, who we want to gather with, to celebrate and in hard times, right? Now, that's, if that's true for you and I, now just think for a moment uh, for people who maybe call other parts of the world home. Now, we as North Americans are known for being individualistic. We pursue our own dreams as individuals. But for many other parts of the world, your very identity is defined by your relationship to your family, like even names. Your name in many other cultures comes from not just you as an individual, but you are known as the son of, and they use the father's name. So that's the degree to which uh, family is important in most, the majority of the world. So much more so than even what I think you and I usually think about. So now, put that in the context of like the refugee family you've sponsored, right? They've had to leave not just their home country, not just their familiar culture, but all their extended family that they've lived with. And they come to a new land, they don't know anybody, they may struggle with the language, they don't maybe, it takes time to understand the culture, and they have no kinship with anybody on the continent. So who do they gather with for celebrations? Who do they go to when there's something to mourn? We all feel that, but especially in cultures where they've always done it as a group, this is extremely isolating. So that's where you, you, you and I as the church, as we embrace, as we invite, as we walk alongside, we can replace, not to exact the same degree, but to try to fill that gap. And this is especially important for those who come from a different faith background. When, when, there, when there are people who come from a different faith background and they come here and they meet Jesus, very often their family 
says, I'm sorry you're no longer part of our family. Some of you know um, Nasser's story, right? Um, and how he, w- he was declared dead to his family when he said yes to Jesus. And so all the more important that as we see people uh, come and walk with us in that journey with Jesus, that we need to come, not just see them on Sunday. And we know for any of us, that's not really healthy church, is it? It's not, we don't come and do church on Sunday. We're to be the church 24-7. So how do we be the church to these newcomers who are isolated? Well, let's invite them in to be part of our family's journey so that they don't feel isolated and alone. Let's truly be family to each other. Now, um, as we move towards wrapping this up, we all have to admit, if we're true to scripture, that none of us actually find our true home here on this earth. This is a temporary lodging for us. We're all called to be sojourners, right? We're simply passing through. Uh, that's in 1 Peter 2.11, It says we are temporary residents and foreigners in this world. Now, this again isn't something that suddenly appeared in the New Testament. We read this all through Scripture. So one passage from the Old Testament, from 1 Chronicles 29. Here, they're dedicating the temple that they've just built. And here's the words, the prayer of Solomon. O our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I, and who are my people, that we could give anything to you? Everything we have has come from you, and we give you only what you first gave us. We are here only for a moment, visitors and strangers in this land, as our ancestors were before us. Our days on earth are like a passing shadow, gone so soon, without a trace. So our focus, God's call to us, is for our focus to be on the eternal, not on the temporal, which is this whole life here on earth. We're to invest in those things that will be not just fleeting, but will last forever. Many of you will be familiar with uh, Hebrews chapter 11, right? The famous faith chapter. And I'm not going to take time to read it here for you this morning, but you remember that it repeats over and over again how people did things by faith, how Abel brought an offering by faith, Enoch went to heaven by faith, Abraham set out by faith, and how by faith Abraham and Sarah had a child. And then it pauses in verse 13 of Hebrews 11 and says this, all these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads on the earth. Do you feel like a nomad? That is what God calls us to. Remember, our ultimate home and citizenship is in heaven. And so we're to press on, inviting others to come on that journey with us. And it's our privilege to be able to do that with those who are from other countries who've come to Canada. But all of us are invited to remember that, to keep that perspective, to call the other to become family with us. Will you pray together with me? Father, thank you that you were not willing to stay with the 99, but that you came searching for each one of us and to invite us to become a part of your family. Lord, we can, we need, we have no other choice but to agree with the words of that song that you have been so, so faithful and so, so good. Lord, I pray for the one that might be here this morning, though, who's still feeling lost who doesn't feel like they've felt that embrace from you or perhaps from others. Lord, would you meet them here this morning and overwhelm them with your love. And Lord, give us eyes to see so we might be aware of those around us 
to put out the welcome in Jesus' name. And Father, especially for the one who we are more conscious of being the other, who isn't like us in some way, Lord, give us your heart to be able to reach out and invite them to whether it be to a meal at our home or to a, a small group or simply to have coffee. Lord, we just pray that we would have the ability to see with your eyes and to respond with your heart of love. Thank you for what you have been doing through this church, and I pray you would continue to grow it, yes, in numbers, but Lord, also in depth of love and uh, that more and more people in Fort Saskatchewan would feel a part of the family of God through this church. And Lord, thank you for the, the tentacles that go out from here, literally around the world, as um, people from here are loving on those who come from so many nations of the world. Would you encourage each one and assure them of um, your plans and purposes to work through them and that ultimately we will, as citizens of heaven, all join together around your throne in worshiping one day. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.